Okay. Oops. Okay, so I'm in. Gabby, can you hear me?
Testing audio. Oh. <clears throat> Testing audio.
Okay, we're about to start. I want to welcome everyone to um, uh, NC CASA's webinar that we're going to do today. I hope you all are doing well. I'm getting ahead of myself already. Um, we're going to be talking about the expanding our reach policy and protocol today, and we're really glad that you all are here. Um, just want to acknowledge that um, this is kind of a crazy time we're all going through right now, and I hope you all are doing what you need to do to stay safe and to take care of things. Um, we're all in this together, and we definitely want to be kind and supportive of each other in our programs. So I do appreciate you all taking the time to join us at the webinar today as we um, talk about these things, equipping North Carolina's rape crisis centers to serve survivors of human trafficking. And as Gabriella just introduced herself in the chat box, she's joining us as our um, training and communication specialist. And she's been great in um, coaching me in this. Um, I'm uh, actually working from home. So um, learning to do all the, the Zoom and the webinar, um, apart from the rest of my staff has been a new thing. And I keep, continue to think about that, um, that BBC uh, thing where the, the guy's talking and, and delivering the news report and his kids are like coming in from the back. Anyway, I don't have kids at home, but I kind of keep thinking of that. Just my cat and he's not, he's not gonna mess with me, so. Um, but anyway, thank you, Gabriella, for uh, fielding some of the uh, facilitating the chats. And we, um, as much as possible, want this to be interactive. Um, so I'll be throwing out some questions during our webinar and um, would love to hear your feedback. Also, if you just have other ideas and thoughts you want to share, um, I'd like to hear that as, as well, too. So. Um, so we are the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and this is a inclusive statewide alliance working to end sexual violence through education, advocacy, and legislation. We are a statewide coalition that uses a social justice framework, so our work is done from a strong intersectional social justice perspective, and by centering our work around marginalized communities, everyone is served. We organize and sponsor statewide trainings related to sexual violence. We support rape crisis programs, resource sharing and technical assistance, legislative agendas and policy change that's locally and nationally. We do anti-human trafficking outreach, prevention education, and do work on colleges and universities. And just a note about language. Um, we use uh, often she as the victim as he, and he is the harm doer because research shows us that about 90% of sexual assault victims are women and the majority of perpetrators are men. Um, victims and harm doers can be of a non-binary gender. And not all women are victims, not all men are perpetrators. Men are victims and women are per perpetrators. So this is me, I'm your presenter today. Um, I have the privilege of serving as the anti-human trafficking specialist with NC CASA. I actually started this role um, back in last year in October. Um, prior to that, I was involved in direct services in Alamance County um, doing human trafficking programming, outreach and awareness. Um, I have about uh, over seven years of direct service experience also in that role, um, and it, prior to working in Crossroads, um, worked with Alamance for Freedom, and we did a lot of um, coordinated community response around human trafficking. Um, also had the privilege of serving on several uh, initiatives and projects, uh, such as Human Trafficking Commission's um, standards of care for serving survivors of human trafficking and also got to work with um, Christy Croft, who formerly had this position. She's now, um, they're now the, um, the prevention, um, let's see, prevention is not coordinator anymore because they're supervising staff. Anyway, doing prevention. And I was, um, had the privilege of working with them on um, equipping the project that uh, we're doing right now, equipping North Carolina rape crisis centers to serve survivors of human trafficking. Um, also have experience as a child forensic interviewer and a lecturer and trainer. So what this project brings to you um, 
in addition to the manual that we co-authored and you can um, certainly write me and I can have um, some of the manuals sent to you, shipped to you as well as some brochures that covers the different aspects of this program or of this project. Um, so in addition to the manual, we have these webinars that are hopefully have been helpful that cover various sections of the manual. Um, this is our, was it, is this our third or fourth? Um, the other uh, webinars included direct services, building a multidisciplinary response, um, and I guess this is our third one. We also have um, in-person training available. Uh, we had a wonderful time um, out in Whiteville about a month ago, um, training on the whole manual on the first day and then the second day Christy covered um, prevent human trafficking prevention. So both days were really, really fun. We had a great group of people. We plan to do the same two day training out West um, sometime in the near future and um, one in the middle of the state at some point. Um, and we also offer um, technical assistance around um, adding human trafficking services to your, to your program. And um, I know I just want to be uh, assistance and an encouragement to you all and your programs um, when you do have issues. Um, so, okay, so today um, we want to talk about policy and protocol around serving survivors and the learning objectives. Really, they're, they're almost like action items. Um, I uh, hope that you can identify two gaps of policy in your program. Um, it can be general, it can be specific, and then um, for each of those gaps, um, I'm going to ask you to identify two items of policy to be added or enhanced, and we'll talk about that as we go along, and then to complete an action plan. And this is trying not to sound too scary, it's just to basically to take some of the things we're going to talk about here and to bring it back into your program and um, help you um, to give you some steps uh, to create change in your program. So let's see. So your action plan um, simply will be uh, what, what are those gaps, what are those policy um, enhancements or additions? And then where will you find resources or support or training around those things to create change? And then how you will implement those things. And then when um, just assigning a realistic timeline to those. So, um, and we'll talk about that at the end. So as we go through the webinar, just keep those things in mind, jot down some things that you um, would like to change or see changed or added to or enhanced in your program. If there's any questions about that, let me know. Let's see. Okay. Oh. Sorry about that. I'm clicking the wrong buttons here. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So I wanted to begin to talk about some of the trends in North Carolina regardly, regarding anti-human trafficking work. And I don't wanna um, sound overly negative, um, but I do want to lean into some things that I have seen and others that I work with have seen. Um, so some of the trends in North Carolina that we're seeing are um, human trafficking only programs and initiatives. There are a lot of them and they continue to um, uh, to emerge. And sometimes it's it's regarding funding initiatives. Sometimes it's because of recent legislation, such as the one that's uh, mandating uh, school uh, personnel be trained on, on sex trafficking and child abuse. And so that is creating um, forming groups that are coming in and, and wanting to address that. Um, there are statewide initiatives that, that lack any meaningful connection to local programs. Um, we also see a lot of law enforcement led interventions that are focused on sex workers or sex buyers. Um, and also uh, a lot of messaging around rescue and relocation. So the, what I mean in this is, is we're seeing a lot of 
statewide activity, um, activity around task force and operations and interventions, but those are not necessarily coming from the local programs or the local communities. And if there are statewide initiatives, sometimes they are not as connected in a real meaning for, um, that's based on relationship and ongoing collaboration. Um, so the impact of some of that is, and, and, and this is something that I and others have seen, and as I talk to you all, definitely things that I have heard as well, um, the impact of that is a lack of confidence in rape crisis centers to serve human trafficking survivors um, because certain groups have centered or focused on hum human trafficking. Sometimes the impact is that local programs will not believe that they are equipped or able or it's even in their right to serve uh, survivors or victims of human trafficking. So there will be a hands-off approach with this other program. The problem with that, and I'm jumping to that number three on impact, the problem with that is when that program goes away, then you have a gap in that community where, where um, those services no longer exist and programs don't feel like they can jump in, in, um, in that gap because they have not been um, um, serving survivors of human trafficking or if they come in contact with them, they have um, referred them out. So that's one thing um, that we're seeing. Also, and, and the, the lack of confidence can be um, sometimes a misunderstanding that, you know, human trafficking survivors are dangerous. There's always gang affiliation. There's always dangers with them recruiting other people. Um, and, and they're just a special kind of survivor that needs to be handled in a special kind of way. And we'll talk about that later on. Um, I think that's really important to, to talk about um, as we discuss services. The other thing that, um, that is there is the neglect of evidence-based prevention model. Um, a lot of the prevention work that folks are doing that are not rooted in rape crisis centers are not really, it's not primary prevention. It's a message of, to the kids, keep yourself safe from traffickers, right? Um, so we real, there's a real gap of evidence-based prevention pr models in uh, the human trafficking world in North Carolina. Um, and I mentioned issues with sustainability. <clears throat> and gaps of meaningful outreach is another impact. And what I mean by that is we can have outreach, we can do outreach activity without there being a real meaningful connection to those communities that we are reaching out to, right? Um, co local community should be doing outreach into our own local community. We, um, and it should be something that is sustained over time and is constant. Um, and because of that outreach, survivors are being identified and served by that program. Um, in direct services, in crisis services, we are inundated with, um, you know, the here and now, right? Sometimes programs don't have the capacity to really build a solid outreach program. Well, we want to help you with that. Um, I definitely want to help you with that. I know NC Casa, we're here to help you in that um, in that work. So, um, you know, it's one thing for a statewide initiative or program to have an outreach component, but where it's impactful and meaningful in the community, that's where our local programs really, really need to be thinking about this. Um, so hopefully you can... Um, um, add that to your list of things to develop. The other thing is gaps of direct services. Um, when law enforcement led interventions or operations dominate the landscape, um, when we're talking about human trafficking, we're talking about victimization, um, this sometimes will lead to assumptions on what it means to serve those survivors. So, 
if we're just talking about rescue, we talk about rescue narrative, rescue culture a lot. Um, if we're talking about the only thing we can do for those folks is to take them to another location, take them out of their situation, um, rescue them from their what they've been doing, that's going to that's um, a real narrow narrowing of our services, right? Um, we understand that all survivors do not want to be rescued, so-called rescued, do not want to be removed from where they're living, don't want to be separated from their community. And as victim advocates, we want to meet folks where they are and to um, support them where they are. But when you have these certain kind of operations, uh, sometimes that pressures or forces the dialogue to go a certain way. So, um, so these trends um, have these impacts, and I think it we are seeing it. We are seeing how services are being rendered due to those um, those trends. So, are there any questions or any comments you all have about that? And just shout them out or write them out and please remember to uh, write any things in the chat box to participants and attendees okay all right so we're going to go over a couple of well several policy topics and these are just the ones that i mean we could talk about a lot of different things these are going to be the ones that are common to our anti-human trafficking work that represent gaps or challenges. Um, so these are basically ones that I've just picked and some that come from the manual as well. First off, before we get into some other things, I really want to um, shout out, give a shout out to the IRENA project. I hope all of you are familiar with this project that's based at UNC. Um, it's basically a, a wonderful project that, that gives us guidance on how to talk about sex trafficking and how um, it monitors how media represents sex trafficking in um, the local and national news. Um, they advocate for the accurate and responsible reporting of the issue. Um, they have a really, really great website that has, um, I wanna highlight that it has these tip sheets. If you go to their resource page, um, if you go to the resource page whoops and it has these tip sheets print these out and share them in your program and um, use them in your trainings it's the really really helpful um, how to talk to media after human trafficking news that's in your area um, how to uh, how to do social media regarding human trafficking and if you follow their twitter and facebook page you would you will really be encouraged it's, extremely helpful um, and I think it brings a lot of dignity to um, to the way we discuss um, survivors and their experiences so definitely want to um, want to bring this in your program I thought I had a chat and I don't know if I did or not let's see no Okay, okay, I do. So with regards to the rescue narrative, what have you seen to be effective ways of eliminating this mentality within local agencies? Okay, so that is a fantastic question. Um, one of the things, this is something that Christy and I train on a lot. We talk about um, the experiences of survivors um, and what they say they want and need. So, so one thing important about human trafficking movement, it was not led, its beginnings was not based in, is not based in survivors th that are leading the movement. It's largely based on outsiders seeing this as, a, as an issue and wanting to do something about it and then guessing what victims need. So the funding all went to a kind of services that require extraction a per, extracting a person from the trafficking situation. So 
And a lot of the awareness and a lot of the public outcry came from helpful outsiders. They're like, oh my gosh, this is a terrible thing. Used a lot of sensationalism. And we bypassed the survivors whose experiences were not exactly like that. So I think as the issue gained momentum, um, that messaging, which was very popular, I mean, it was very, you know, um, the sensationalized images, um, the chains, the, the duct tape, the white van, the rumors that, you know, um, I think that feeds into that rescue narrative um, and the assumption that we need to show up and take this person out of their situation. Well, rape crisis centers and DV um, program, you know, we understand, understand meeting someone where they are, right? Um, when someone is fleeing um, an, uh, an abusive situation with their partner, they're not necessarily looking to, to, to leave their partner. They're not ready at the time, right? But they go to the shelter, they go to the program after a sexual assault or a physical assault saying this happened and they need support. Um, they need information, they need advocacy, but they may not be ready to leave their situation. So with human trafficking, the same, the same way, sometimes, you know, especially if they're, okay, if they're a minor, that's different, right? But if they're a 25 year old um, who has been trafficked, who has, you know, they may not be ready. They may, there may be a lot of other issues. And so we can't impose that on them. Um, so I think the more we are representing survivors' voices, um, having survivors speak into this issue, that will slowly change the narrative. Um, but I think um, I, I think we have to keep um, I think we have to keep talking about that. So great question. Thank you for your um, for asking that. All right, so I'm going to start with um, referral networks. So my question to programs, and you can answer this if you like, um, how are survivors finding you? How are survivors connecting with your services? Um, is your program largely um, reliant on law enforcement to bring you cases or to, bring, to, refer, you, to refer clients to your program? Uh -huh. they, are they showing up? Are they saying, hey, you know, this happened to me, this is happening to me, um, so how are they finding your services? Um, if you made a list of folks, uh, of agencies that are referring or people who are self-referring, what would that list look like? And um, I would say that if you're only getting referrals from one agency uh, or just a few, we've got some work to, to do, right? Um, you want a diverse referral network and you want I mean that can include law enforcement of course but it should also include these other agencies here um, such as uh, youth serving agencies oh I did youth twice um, youth ser serving agencies such as maybe um, youth centers youth programs uh, community-based programs mental health um, criminal justice, um, health, let's do it, see, healthcare professionals, schools, um, um, other agencies. Let me just try to catch this chat. Nope, okay, all right. Okay, walk-ins at FJC Diversion Program, RHA. So we have mental health, walk-ins, family justice centers. Um, those are really great. Um, referral partners. So one of the things is if we are, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of um, harping on this a bit, but I feel like it's necessary. If we're relying on task, task forces or our, our criminal justice system alone or relying on them for most of our referrals, our program is not going to be sustainable. Um, and do survivors know about your program? And do other programs who work in the community know about your program? Do they know that you serve survivors of human trafficking? Do they even know what human trafficking is? Um, you could be standing in the same room with someone and they know you do human trafficking stuff, but, but when they try to explain what 
it is, they may not even have an accurate understanding of what human trafficking is. So part of our job is to not only tell people, give an accurate representation of human trafficking, but also explain how we serve those survivors, right? Um, and so what we want to do, and those of you who know me aren't going to be surprised that I say this, you want to cultivate relationships with your community partners. Maybe they're not partners yet. Maybe they're in your community. Maybe it's um, Salvation Army Boys and Girls Club. Um, maybe it's a, um, um, you know, a program that you rarely interact with. You know, you want to have, you want to initiate a meeting. You want to share your program, right? You want to um, build a relationship. You also want to learn about each other's um, um, services. One of the things um, I did when I was doing uh, work in Alamance County for our SART team, was it our SART? Yeah. One of the things we did was invite, or no, it was a staff meeting actually, invite other agencies to come and present. So come and present their services, how to do referrals, kind of the, the procedures, the contact information, and share that information face to face. Don't just go on websites and but talk to someone and and do co-learning together learn from one another things that they've learned in doing their work and what they've learned about the community and identify together where the gaps are and how you can work together um, and you work on that um, relationship and um, and when we put the time into that there will be those referrals from those agencies that will happen um, also, when you are collaborating with a survivor uh, with a case with, on a case, um, as far as confidentiality allows, let there be equal access to information as far as possible. Um, keep each other in the loop. Um, invite one another to the train to the trainings that you all have. Um, and another thing that's really important in um, creating these networks is do not just case reviews if if that's appropriate, but process reviews, right? So maybe there was a referral process and it was a little clunky. Um, you get, go back, you circle back and you have a conversation like, hey, how could we have done that better? Or how could we have done that in a way that took the survivor's interest, um, uh, um, had their interest, that they were better served or um, there was less communication breakdowns or that kind of thing. Um, so you have process reviews um, and that you're constantly updating one another's contact information. Talk about how you're gonna deal with con conflict. So maybe you're working with a, a local faith-based faith organization and you know there's gonna be some challenges sometimes talk about ahead of time. So when we're in conflict over this thing, you know, how, how are we gonna work through that? How, how are we gonna w work on that? So you talk about that stuff. And as, as you go through those processes, you're building trust and your organization is going to be known for um, and that wants to be a part of the community that doesn't believe it's like a part or above or outside, but you're part of the community, you're willing to learn, you're willing to receive uh, feedback, and that goes a long way. Um, so you definitely, and I use that word networks because um, now sometimes it's only going to be one way, right? But, but ideally, you know, say your local uh, domestic, uh, your family justice center, um, like someone had had shared, you're going to be referring both ways, right? Um, ideally, a survivor is going to access all kinds of community, and you all are going to be familiar with those processes. Um, and that way, it cuts down on territorialism, um, and it just it builds community and builds trust, and and really everyone wins when that happens. Also, you learn more about one another. Um, and that's great, obviously, that's great too. So, so building your referral networks that, that includes um, a wide range of service agencies. Make sure you're including your vulnerable populations, your, your, your services uh, to vulnerable populations and groups that you may not usually hear from and think about that. So any questions regarding referral, building referral networks or comments? Okay, cool.
So on your action plan, if you have any thoughts like, hey, that's something that I need to add to my program or something that needs to be tweaked or enhanced, you put that on your, your, your plan. All right, moving on. Okay, so So question, do human trafficking survivors require separate programs? And that is a really, really big question and conversation that I have had. Um, let's see. Oh, you know what? I missed something. I was going to talk about working with other anti-human trafficking. Let me just, let me actually go back. So, so talking about working with other anti-human trafficking groups, um, your local program, you might be working with another group within your community um, or a statewide human trafficking group. That can be great. It has its own set of challenges. And I encourage you again to um, build those relationships that's based on mutual respect. Um, center is obviously going to have different um, um, rules, policies around confidentiality and privileged communication. Um, statewide uh, anti-human trafficking groups don't have that privileged communication. There's going to be different ideas about confidentiality. Be very, very clear on those things. Be very clear, have a clear understanding of their practice of confidentiality um, and what you know what your inform how your information may be used, especially if they're working more closely with law enforcement. So be careful on that. Um, be aware of, um, and I'm I'm sure you are, but but where where someone is required to go through multiple intake procedures, um, we know that can be very harmful. We know that can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, maybe even within a program. A, per, a survivor is required or asked to tell their story to several different staff. Um, as an advocate, step up on that. If there's some way to cut down those multiple intake procedures, do that. Advocate for your person. Say that's not necessary. You know, what information, you know, do you need to know can give me permission to share? But um, so advocate from that because that is a common challenge. Um, let's see. But also developing those relationships can be very, very valuable. And we want those partnerships, but also um, it takes work to, um, to make it work. So any questions on that? Okay, so um, Tamika mentioned uh, transparency with survivor prior to consisting with, yeah. So we definitely want to be open with survivors about working with other agencies. I think that's what you meant um, when you mentioned that. Um, we don't go to other agencies uh, without permission from that survivor and be transparent. Um, one thing that I have noticed sometimes is, is uh, advocates will talk about the survivor without the survivor being part of that conversation. And it's, it's very powerful. None of us would want to be treated that way. Two people discussing, you know, what we should do with our lives or, or, you know, helping them and you're not in the room. You know, bring that person in, sit them down, have a meeting, talk with them. Um, and that also can help with triangulation. You may have experienced that where you're working with someone, a survivor, and they're working with two different advocates from different agencies and they or not just the survivor, but there's triangulation that happens. So everyone in the same room talking about things, everyone's on the same page. And that's very empowering. You're not telling the survivor what to do with decisions they should be making, but you're empowering them with information and listening and honoring what they're saying. So that takes work. It takes work and it takes trust, but, um, but it's, it's, um, it's good advocacy. So, all right. One second. All right, next slide. 
now okay so do human trafficking survivors require separate programs or separate services this is a big um big question we can say yes we can say no we can say yes and no it depends that kind of thing so are human trafficking survivors different do they require their own program do they require their own special advocate do they require their own um separate whatever type of services type of pol um, policy so that's sort of the overarching question as we go through these things how are human trafficking survivors different um i think that when we look narrowly at um i'm just let's just i'm since i'm picking on law enforcement so much that's and if you know me you, you would know i, I do look there are, i have worked with some fantastic law enforcement agencies and officers and um but i'm just so i'm being very general in the anti i'm just look at looking at the media looking at the headlines um you know you can see that there's there's challenges around this but when you're just looking at those task forces and the human trafficking operations and you're just looking at trafficking uh, sex workers who may or may not be trafficking survivors um you'll have a certain view of human trafficking survivors and they, they're all on drugs they're all gang involved they're all this and that and they they and they all need this kind of service that may be true for that subset of people right but if you draw the lens back and look more widely at human trafficking um absolutely our programs are already set up to serve to serve them okay um there are some cases where procedures need to be enhanced need to you know there's some things that need to be changed a little bit for sure and i'd love for you all to you know just to share that um so make those changes make those enhancements but i you know definitely you're already at a great position to serve to serve them so let's just go through each one of these and and talk about what might need to be changed or added or enhanced to serve survivors so screening um does this require a separate type of service um this sometimes can depend on if your program is is funded just to serve human trafficking survivors so if that's the case then you have to somehow prove provide provide some proof that this person is trafficked now how you're going to do that you you need to be as trauma informed and person centered as possible um you're not going to make someone in in their time of crisis go through a rigorous list of yes or no questions or invasive questions right right off the bat that's not going to be best practice um but use some kind of tool that's going to be is um cause the least amount of trauma or actually cause no trauma um that's not going to be harmful to the person so there's different kind of screening tools um sometimes you can just make that assessment on your own and i know christy croft and i like to talk about needs assessment over screening um and think that can be an effective low impact way of assessing what this person needs and the possible and, and to see if they are um to note if they are trafficked or not so that's um that's one of the procedures that we might want to think about um intake that can look like um that can take a, a lot of different um take on a lot of different kinds of uh ways that we do intake that sentence didn't really make any sense anyway depending on where you do intake how that person is referred to you or if they are in a state of crisis if they have just gotten out of jail it, and they don't have it, hardly anything except what they were wearing when they were arrested and they show up your program um, needing some help um there's going to be you know different ways we can do intake um you may want to think about have several different um procedures based on the person's need um if someone comes to your program in the middle of the night or from you know they've um been in a very traumatic situation maybe there's a room that you have set up in your program where they could just sleep for a couple hours 
before you do all this paperwork, right? Um, and they feel safe and they feel like they can just kind of chill out and relax, um, especially if they're in a high state of crisis or coming down off of something. I mean, and obviously there's safety issues around that. Sometimes that person needs to go straight to detox if they are, you know, if they want to do that. Um, but you're going to have to make those allowances. Um, and again, that, that depends on how your referrals come in. Um, if you're meeting someone at the hospital, you may already have a, uh, a procedure for that in your program. But if the person is coming into the hospital, not for a SANE kit, but some other way, and the person at, at the, um, the hospital does call you, how do you do intake there? How, um, how much off-site work do you do? Um, if you are working with law enforcement on some level and they call you up to um, criminal investigation division because someone that they um, were talking to regarding, you know, witnessing another crime, they realize that person may be a survivor or caught up in human traffic, being trafficked and they recognize that and they may call your program and say, hey, we have someone up here in CID that would like to talk to you about about your services. Are you able, does your program have the capacity to send someone over there to sit down with that person and just introduce yourself and share your services? Um, so you, you wanna, um, I do think there are several, um, you know, human trafficking, can include situations that that do um, that would be a good idea for us to have a, a good bit of flexibility. I know that there are some folks that want you to be able to dispatch someone at 2 a.m. in the middle of the night, wherever you know that person has been trafficked. Well, it might be more appropriate to, for the person to meet you at your rape crisis center at your program. So think about different ways that you can provide do some sort of intake. <laughs> um, that's going to fit the need of that person. I mean, you know, if we are going to serve human trafficking survivors, we're going to have to do make some changes, right? We're going to need to make some enhancements to our procedure. And if you want to talk more specifically with me about that, that's my job. I'm, I'm excited and happy to provide technical assistance to, to your programs. <clears throat> so there's... Uh, also, safety planning. Um, when we talk to uh, survivors regarding um, their safety, that can mean a lot of different things depending on, you know, where they are. Um, you might have someone who's just been pulled from a trafficking situation. She, she, she um, you know, kind of held at gunpoint for a couple of days, and that does happen. Um, but the, instead of going to some place that you feel like is safe, they may just want to go back and party with their friends at the hotel. And that's, you know, you might think that is not a good idea, but that person is 20 and they have, you know, they have every right to do that. And so you meet them wh where they are and you go over some things that may, you know, that you might, you want them to think about or information that they really need to have to make some decisions, but you want to meet them where they are and understanding that um, depending on where the person's coming from, safety is really going to be a lot of different kinds of trade-offs. Um, what we, all right, we're all going to have different ideas of safety and um, depending on what identities they hold, um, where, what communities that they are um, from, um, there's going to be things that, that not everyone is prioritizing. So safety planning is going to look a little different. Um, we love the full frame initiatives, five domains of well-being. I would encourage you very much to look it up and to look at the work that they've done there. But they, um, it's sort of a different way of looking at safety planning, um, understanding that we all need certain things like social connectedness, stability, safety, mastery, and meaningful access to relevant resources. And sometimes those are more important than, you know, staying in a locked room. You know, I know I'm sure you've heard people talk about, well, jail's safe. Yeah, jail's safe in one way, but it's definitely not safe in a lot of other ways. Yes, you get to go through detox for free, but, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to do that. Um, we think it's okay for survivors sometimes. So um, 
we safety, we really talk about a lot of trade-offs and um, that need for social connectedness is more important um, for a lot of survivors and, and for all of us really than to be transported across the state to stay in a hotel room or someone's shelter. Sometimes we can act so surprised that this person doesn't want to stay in this shelter that's eight counties away. Well, you know, if we can't understand that, we might need to do a little bit more training. <laughs> we may need a little bit more training. So, um, again, the five domains of well being go through those five, literally five domains, and um, really helps us when we, when we talk to survivors about some of. Um, some ways that they can keep themselves safe and on the road to uh, them feeling empowered and well. Okay, so making appointments, that's gonna be something we do. Um, we understand that some survivors of human trafficking are gonna have more of a challenge around that, particularly if someone's coming out of a situation where they have very little resources and very little access to resources, so phones, um, reliable transportation, even the being in a, 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 a state where the person can um, even make an appointment can be challenging. So we want to be able, so I've worked with programs that are, in, that are so ready to basically, after a person misses a couple of appointments, to basically ban them from their program. Well, you know, we're going to have to give some allowances. Um, we need to understand that making appointments, that, that having a full schedule when someone is still in a high state of crisis and trauma is going to be very difficult. So, um, so we need to think through ways that that's going to meet that need or acknowledge that challenge. So case management um, means a lot of different things to a lot of different folks. Um, this is where someone who has a variety of needs, um, has a point person to sort of help coordinate um, the services and help nav sometimes help that survivor navigate systems like the criminal justice system or if that survivor is getting their kids back. There's a lot of work around working with CPS, um, uh, court, uh, DSS court, um, parent child um, so was it child family team meetings, working with the schools, that can be very, very be overwhelming and bewildering. So it's very helpful to have someone coordinating those cases. Um, in my experience, it's very helpful to have a team um, and to have a team that puts that survivor in the center and supporting that survivor and their connection to their families or their community and supporting that. Um, too many times I've seen service certain advocates be almost antagonistic toward other family members because they think that they're unsafe because there might be, you know, there might be things like drugs and other things in the background. So we insist that, that survivors stay cut off from their community. That is not um, meeting folks where they are. And too many times we can decide what is safe and wise and good for another person. And we have to be very careful not to do that. And community connection and family reunification is often going to be not always, but often going to be very important. And so we have to be prepared to, to um, support the entire family. And if we can't ourselves, it's going to be through other agencies and other other supports, but that's going to be part of our case management if we do provide that service. Okay. Follow up is going to be important. Um, you're going to have to make assessments on safety and, and, and have a clear conversation with the survivor how to do follow up. Um, how long to do follow-up, to stay in touch with someone. Um, does that person want some weekly check-ins? Sometimes making an appointment and showing up at a program is not um, realistic. That person may not feel safe in your program for lots of reasons. So maybe just a, a weekly check-in, 
um, sometimes through social media, sometimes a person doesn't keep a phone very long and, and doing something through social media, you're going to have to get creative because of personal boundaries. So um, our, our program had a program, <laughs> this was a long time ago, but we had a program social media account and that's how we could um, keep in contact with some folks who didn't have um, phone service or um, a consistent phone number. So, so get creative, but have that in policy, have that, that written down somewhere so that can back you up. Um, Cause there's some boundary issues around that, but we want to, you know, using Google, Google numbers, things like that. Um, but some, some way of, of checking in and um, that connection can be very, very meaningful to a survivor, even if that's all you do is just a basic weekly check in or a text. Hey, how's it going? What's good? You know, what's, what's, what's going on? What's good? Um, how have you been strong today? Just thinking of you, those things can be um, very effective. Um, we want to, you know, be aware of our own boundaries. Um, but having some sort of follow-up plan can be really helpful. Um, and then the last is criminal justice involvement. As we know, a lot of survivors, um, particularly of sex trafficking, unfortunately are going to have a, a good degree of involvement in the criminal justice system or the juvenile justice system. We want to be very, um, as much as possible educated on those systems and we want to be familiar with the staff in those systems. So we want to know the court counselors. We want to know if possible, the judges. We want to know the, the assistant district attorneys. We want to be familiar. Um, um, often our clients are gonna be defendants. <laughs> They're not gonna be um, part of the prosecution. They're gonna be um, those who have been charged with crimes or have a good deal of a record, all kinds of things um, sometimes. So sometimes we do our work at court, at jail. Um, it would be good for programs to have, um, I know there's PREA, um, but this is something a little bit different. Um, we want to have policies that um, provide us with the, provide you with the opportunity to go to the courts, to sit in court or to um, interact to go meet with an attorney and your client or the judge and your client, um, that kind of thing. Sometimes you'll be, um, um, a, a, uh, what's the word? A sentencing specialist may reach out to you and have uh, conversations or do you have a diversion program for this? So um, we want to be familiar with our local criminal justice system on some level as much as you're able and some advocates don't really have the capacity because of their own lived experience. So we want to be aware of that. But um, a lot of sex trafficking survivors have involvement in the criminal justice system. So we do want to have um, some places in our policies around that. So any, um, any thoughts on that? Anything that I've just mentioned on these one, two, three, these uh, five, six, seven um, items. I would love to hear back from you. I'm going to grab a drink of water. Just a second. One thing I did want to add is um, we want to have policies and practices in our programs that include um, sex workers and not all sex workers are human trafficking survivors, right? But because of some of the anti-human trafficking messaging and campaigning, sex workers uh, don't love anti-human trafficking programs. I'll just, I'm putting that a little bit mildly and will avoid our programs. And that is understandable. Um, but it is, uh, important part of our work to meet people where they are. And if a sex worker, um, we should assume they would be okay with coming in with a, um, a report of sexual assault, but we there's a lot of training that still needs to happen where people have the idea that you cannot be 
raped if you're a sex worker or if you are raped as a sex worker you're automatically a human trafficking survivor when that person doesn't want to have that doesn't want to identify as such so we need to think about our programs and how we provide services to identified sex workers um, we could talk a long time about that but i wanted to throw that out there um, when someone who is doing sex work and they are um, raped by their last date um, when their work was negotiated and they did not negotiate for a certain sex act that sex act happened without their consent they ought to be able to walk into our program with that story and not be fit into a category that they do not identify does that make sense um, so we want to make sure that we are including all survivors and meeting them where they are and not impressing an identity on them that they are not claiming and they do not want. So um, I know there's a, sometimes a lot of conflation that all sex work is trafficking and all sex workers need to be rescued from their sex work. Um, that uh, we need to do a little bit of work <laughs> if that's the case. So if any of you all need to talk or want to engage with me later about that, I'm very happy to do that. I don't know if anyone wants to uh, share anything about that there uh, on this um, on this webinar, but I wanted to to mention that. Okay. okay. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, new staff, new programs, new funding, and this is, let me see, something I want to, okay, and um, I had a, there's a great comment here, um, sex workers are also some of the strongest allies in anti-human trafficking work. Thank you so much for adding that. Um, that is very much the case as well. And j just like everyone has a story, everyone has a different different background, everyone shows up with different lived experiences. So um, I'm really glad that they shared that, um, that they can be some of the strongest allies. So that is, that is really important. Thank you for, for adding that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate this valuable use of language. Appreciate you saying that. Thanks. Okay, so new staff, new program, new funding. Um, sometimes when a program receives some money for human trafficking stuff, um, there can be an advocate that's designated as human trafficking specialist, or um, sometimes it, a lot of times it's just one staff person, um, or there could be a new initiative um like human trafficking court or something else um to do with that um i just wanted to give some policy directives on um some things that i have seen and it's really like a, just an encouragement um i was really excited to see these little icons too when i was putting this together the <laughs> um don't silo so it's really important that when you have a, when your program has a new advocate and you might be that person. So, um, so, so write this down and take this to your supervisor that they're not siloed and, and left um, separated from the rest of the agency. So human trafficking is best set in the context of a rape crisis center, right? So they should have access to all the sexual violence programming, the prevention programming. Um, they're not separate. Um, so, so don't have a, your rape crisis center with your with your primary prevention program, but over here you have human trafficking program that's using the chosen curriculum, which tells kids to be safe from traffickers. So, so don't silo them in their own um, program that's separate from the entire rape crisis center program. I hope that makes sense. Um, a lot of reasons for this. Number one, we want survivors to be to receive the best services possible um, and we want sustainability right and also we want to train the entire staff don't just have if you have this one person and all the human trafficking stuff is on them when they go your program is bereft of human trafficking programming 
Um, so we definitely want, they need the support of the entire agency. Um, the ED and all, all the folks should know what that person is doing for lots of reasons. Um, and I'll give you an example. Services to, this is completely written, you know, repeat, repeat. Services to survivors of human trafficking, they deserve the same services as um, someone who's not been trafficked but is there for other kinds of sexual assault. We do not, we do not take someone who's been the victim of domestic violence incident or rape and fuss at them for not keeping themselves safe. We better not be, or fuss at them for continuing to go back to a situation. Okay, example. You're going to wear that skirt again. You're going to get raped again. You're going to wear that same outfit that you got raped in. We don't do that. We shouldn't be doing that with human trafficking, right? So we meet people where they are. We don't victim blame. And we don't pressure and manipulate them to go back into a situation, right? But sometimes human trafficking work, we see that happening. And I think sometimes it does have to do with this pressure to rescue, this pressure to save lives, this pressure to, you know, we went through all that to pull you from that situation and now you're going to go back. Well, what if they do and they come back into our program? We will welcome them every single time, right? Um, we're not here to fix people's lives uh, in that way, right? So we meet them where they are. So we want the, the new staff, the new volunteers that are designated to, for human trafficking, we want them to get all the resources that they need to do their job well. So an onboarding and professional develop, development plan is really, really important. So also it, for that onboarding plan for new people, don't just say, go find all the other human trafficking people in the state and ask them what they've done. So you're putting the burden of your staff training on other programs who don't have the capacity to train your staff. Does that make sense? Um, I understand collaboration. I understand reaching out, learning who's who. But to come to another program and say, tell me everything you know, or email that per person you know is not really fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's pour into the new staff. Let's get them a good training program that's cross training, right? Um, someone doing human trafficking work should definitely also have those key competencies for sexual violence, right? So, um, if you need help on training and the training plan, NC Casa is here for you. This is what we do. This is what we love to do. Um, if your program needs some, um, uh, some support around that, some technical assistance around training, we are here for you. It's what we do. That's what I love to do. Um, so they have a strong sexual violence framework. They're, they're coming to their human trafficking work with that. Um, they need to understand systemic racism. They need to understand um, marginalized communities, right? So let's, um, let's have them have access to all of what your rape crisis center has. We definitely um, want folks to understand primary prevention. That is a real gap I see in anti-human trafficking work and we have a lot of opportunity to, um, to fill that gap. Um, one thing that is really great when we're uh, training for tra for um, new staff is also train not just the person, all the staff, and um, the SART team or whatever your case review team or multidisciplinary team is. So training that group together is a really, really good way of um, collective impact. So, any questions or comments or feedback on that? Okay. All right. Okay. So I want to share with you a wonderful, let me check my time. Okay. I want to share with you a wonderful resource called <clears throat> uh, Trauma Informed Principles Through a Culturally Specific Lens. And the website um, um, is down at the bottom. And this is through um, Hear Our Voices. 
and it is a really, really great, how many pages? Like five or six, okay, 10 pages. Um, I would encourage you to find this and print this out and have this, um, share this in your program. Um, and it, it basically um, defines the core principles of a trauma-informed work through culturally specific analysis. Um, and it's intended for culturally specific community-based organizations um, to provide the practitioners with a accessible language to describe the trauma-informed culturally specific overlap of their work. So um, we definitely want to be able to resist re-trauma, re-traumatization oh, re in our programs. Um, and this was a very helpful document. Um, I'm not gonna assume everyone has, I'm, let me just read real quickly the um, definition of trauma. I want to assume everyone understands. It's always good to, to review this. Um, trauma is the experience of an event or enduring condition in which the individual or com and or community experiences a threat to the life, the psychic, or bodily integrity and experiences intense fear, helplessness, or horror. A key aspect of traumatic experiences is that when the individual and or community's coping capacity, and I, I wanted to emphasize the community, we tend to think, or we can tend to think of just the individual. This is, includes when a community's coping capacity is overwhelmed. Trauma often impacts multiple domains, including physical, social, emotional, and spiritual. Trauma can take many forms, such as collective and community trauma, historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, and insidious trauma. And I just wanted to emphasize that historical trauma, which is the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanating from massive group trauma. And I say that because, again, anti-human trafficking work that's done apart from rape crisis centers, who, which have a strong intersectional uh, lens, can really miss this whole historical trauma. So we have to understand some of our marginalized communities experience of trauma in order to serve a survivor of human trafficking from those communities. So I really just wanted to throw this, um, this piece out and have, have um, give you access to that. And I want to go through the principles that this document um, uh, goes through, and I have them written down here. So uh, principle is relationships based on mutuality and respect. And that's just across the board. That is always going to be something that we should value very highly. Um, let's see. Let me, let me get this chat here. Yeah. Okay. Can we get a list of the resources given in this presentation email to us once completed? Sure, we can do that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, principle, seek a deep understanding of the communities you work with and centralize this cultural understanding in your work. Um, I think sometimes we have an, uh, uh, not a deep understanding, but a slight understanding of some of the communities we work in. Um, and we want our services open to all members of the community. So we have homework, we have work to do. We have to learn what communities are out there. Um, and the ones we're not hearing from are the ones we need to be hearing from. So, and if we're not hearing from them, that usually means we have some work to do uh, in our own programs. So understand the origin of trauma, including historical collect and the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Do not minimize the resiliency, wisdom and strength of survivors. They have much to teach on how to heal from trauma. And I love this. Um, we, we focus so much on what is wrong or what has happened. We also want to focus on what you have learned and what, you, what your community has learned to overcome this together. And that will inform our intervention strategies, honestly. Um, the more we learn about how people heal, the more we will learn on how to help in the midst of crisis. Okay, fourth one, keep the realities of the survivor and their children central to your work, regardless 
service work that you do. So even if you're not doing direct services, if you're out there doing prevention work, keep the realities of the survivor and their children central to your work. Um, one thing I miss about direct services is direct services. And this is why I got into this work. And every day that I don't do direct services, I'm getting further and further away from that. I want to stay current. I want to keep that reality forefront in my mind as I do this work at NC CASA. Fifth, your organization alone will not be able to end violence. Believe in the power and collective wisdom of communities. And I think that's beautiful. <clears throat> okay, so I just wanted to share that with you all and hope that it's helpful. <clears throat> Okay. All right, now I could have added a lot of different groups here. I just, I pulled just four. Um, let's talk about outreach for a little bit while staying on. Yeah, 310, we're good. So outreach is not awareness, okay? Outreach is activity in the communities that you are trying to reach to identify survivors so that they can be connected to resources, right? To services. So we know the LGBTQ community is a group that has experienced a great deal of, of trauma, especially when we talk about um, human trafficking. We know trans youth are a, um, an, a, a significant group that is experiencing a significant amount of uh, victimization through trafficking. Um, what are your outreach efforts to those communities? Um, if you need help or assistance in discussing strategies, definitely NC CASA is a great resource for you. We'd love to have that conversation. Um, our immigrant community, we know the current political climate has impacted um, the way the uh, immigrant communities can feel safe in um, identifying as um, needing services or, or um, so when we work so closely with law enforcement, we obviously have to be very aware what that's going to look like, the impact of that. So we want to be very careful. We want to be very intentional about how we are doing our work and who we are collaborating with and how we're collaborating with. Um, we want to learn how communities are vulnerable because of their marginalization. So they're not, they're, they're not vulnerable because they're vulnerable. They're vulnerable because they're marginalized. Um, so we want to think about that. We want to understand that they may not access our services because we're not doing that, the outreach that we need to. So if we're not um, reaching out to them, if sometimes it's we can reach out to the people who are serving them instead of um, directly. So um, that is one strategy as well. I wanted to mention adult care programs and facilities. Um, I don't know if you are very aware of um, the adult protective services in your areas, but um, older adults can be vulnerable to being labor and sex traffic, particularly in these adult care programs. They're a vulnerable population. Um, we've been discussing uh, this um, having to do with some recent legislation, um, we've been talking about um, adults with developmental disabilities or intellectual disabilities as being a very vulnerable group. So um, think about that when you're talking about outreach and those referral networks, reach out to the Adult Protective Services with your um, DSS agency and um, other group homes and, um, and those that community. Also, I did mention earlier sex workers. Um, I don't have time to share this article too, but I'm gonna, and I'll send the link to you. It's um, the title is a uh, news article. It's in a Florida county, sex workers are ensnared in trafficking raids, and it's talking about you know task force and other operations arresting all these folks, and they're calling them human trafficking operations, and they're arresting sex workers or folks who are trafficked, but they're arresting sex workers in the hopes of finding trafficked survivors. And, um, and we kind of know how that goes. So this is a really good article that outlines that. And it's also from a different 
community so if it, it, you can use it without feeling like you're poking fun or poking holes at your own um, county's sheriff's off, but I think it's a, a useful article and the very end was very helpful. It also features a couple of folks who um, have done a lot of good work um, around this issue, but I wanted to, to read the last quote, um, who's a professor at the University of South Florida she, who researches sex work and trafficking, and she, her name is Jill McCracken, and Jill says, we're putting our resources into surveillance and criminalization. I continually ask, what are we doing to reduce the conditions that cause vulnerability, because when someone is vulnerable, they're at more risk for trafficking and exploitation. I'm gonna say that again. We're putting our resources into surveillance and criminalization. I continually ask, what are we doing to reduce the conditions that cause vulnerability? Because when someone is vulnerable, they are more at risk for trafficking and exploitation. And when we do outreach into these marginalized communities, we, the more isolated anyone is, the more vulnerable they are, right? The more, when we don't talk about something, it, it adds a layer to that vulnerability. It adds a layer to that isolation and that silence. So I think the way sex workers are being treated as potential trafficking victims, and some of them are, some of them have that lived experience, that's true. But the way we are focusing on these raids and operations and surveillance, there's just something that <laughs> it really is, it, it should bother us. And we should, and it's difficult to speak about it because we don't want, we often don't want to alienate community partners, right? Especially when we're working on developing those relationships with you know, investigators, detectives, DAs, but we, at the same time, you know, we have an opportunity to speak into the the impact that those those operations or those those kind of coerced interventions are are how how they're impacting these groups, right? Um, and so I think we need to find it would be good for us to find language, a way to talk to engage our community partners, particularly in criminal justice system, about the impact these things are having. So I wanted to share that with you to kind of give you something to use in your, you know, your conversations or trainings. Um, and also, you know, it, it's, it's good to build relationships or people who are former, former sex workers to learn. Um, and we're gonna talk about survivor leadership in a second and learn from them about, about these things. Um, and too many times we're having these conversations with folks that do not have lived experience and we're, we're speaking for them when we should be learning from them. So any questions or comments about this? Okay. Okay. okay, so survivor leadership. This is where I would like to hear from you all if you have experience in your programs in um in building this so i in the manual we have a, a pretty good bit to say about this um i wanted to because of time i just wanted to capture some oh i need to wrap it up um capture some of these thoughts and i just want to put it out there and i hear a couple of comments from you all or questions if you have any um again Human trafficking movement was not survivor led. It did not originate from survivors saying enough, you know, we want to do something about this. It was, it was generally good people. <laughs> you seeing a thing, hearing about a thing and, and wanting to intervene to do something about it. And um, we weren't completely uh, accurate in what exactly needed to be done, right? Um, so from ship, you know, we want definitely to include survivors, those with lived experience, um, being trafficked, <coughs> and going about and how we go about that is important. So, so just a few things. Um, we're not talking about just a spokesperson for your program or your fundraiser, right? Um, kind of a token person to just say a few things. Um, I mean, that is definitely one way you can engage survivors for sure. And there may be survivors who are very happy to do, um, but 
But when we talk about survivor leadership or, you know, learning from folks with lived experience, this is not all we're talking about. Um, so we want to think beyond presentations or think beyond, you know, keynote speaker. Um, really, we want their, their input into policies. Um, we want their input into outreach methods. Um, well, I'll just give you a quick story. I was working on this little kind of a little brochure. We were um, doing outreach into a really, really poor neighborhood that had just multi-generational abuse, a lot of crime, a lot of gang activity. To, and we were doing a table and we wanted to connect with the youth in that area. And I wanted to do like a little, and none of our human trafficking brochures or it had anything that, that would make sense to people who were not doing um, uh, service provision. So it was, I realized a lot of our material is to other service providers, but not to the people we're actually trying to reach, right? So I had a survivor uh, friend who was a survivor. I was working with her on this. So there were three questions that you would ask that would get a young person's attention, that would know what, you know, what we were talking about. So, so they actually worked with me on um, creating the, uh, the content for that little bitty flyer. It was really useful. It was very helpful. So, you know, in, input into policies, input into outreach methods, you know, oh, yeah, that's not going to work. No one's going to listen to you if you say that or do that or go here or, you know, um, or let me tell you how that's going to impact things. But also understanding, just like every survivor is, is a descriptor of someone's relationship to a, spe a specific kind of lived experience, it's not necessarily a skill set, right? And so the survivors we work with are going to have their own unique skill sets of skills, triggers, experiences, professional certifications, and areas of expertise. And I was quoting from the manual just then. So, uh, but we, but their voice is very valuable. Um, and and one thing, and I think we've learned is um, we must have they must have access to compensation. You're planning a training, or people are talking about a conference. Conference, they're like, oh, I have a survivor that's going to do. What we can do is say, are they being compensated? So our advocacy can be ensuring or at least throwing the question out and making a lot of people really uncomfortable because maybe they haven't even thought about it, um, you know, saying that person deserves to be compensated. Well, how much? Well, I don't know. How much would you, you know, <laughs> how, how do you negotiate prices or, you know, um, money or being paid for a presentation? Um, Ask them, negotiate with them. So uh, we definitely can advocate that way as well. So these are just some ideas about how to incorporate survivor leadership. Another thing is you may already have survivors in your staff, they just haven't identified as such. So we always we can assume that they're always out there somewhere. They may be already on your staff. So um, again, you know, a lot of us are in this work because of lived experience. We don't go around saying, hey, when were you sexually assaulted? but we know that that can definitely be part of the fabric of our staff and volunteers. Um, so you may already have survivors of trafficking in your program. So I just wanted to share that as well. So any comments or questions around that? And we're just about done. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm not gonna have a whole lot of time to cover this, but I wanted to just mention working with faith-based faith groups. This is a broad conversation, distilling it down to a couple of ideas. So why, why do we work with faith-based groups? Um, faith is a motivation to serve, can be a motivation to serve others. Faith communities can have access to a lot of resources, um, space in their meeting places, money, um, volunteers sometimes if that's appropriate so there's they have connections to a local community and with some um some communities um well not all are a good fit for anti-human trafficking work or collaboration we know that and on the faith-based community community can be the place where a lot of trauma originated in survivors they could have received a great deal of harm from the faith-based faith-based communities at the same time Faith communities can be something that is extremely healing to survivors. So everyone has a different narrative, a different story. Um, we have to acknowledge that it's not always going to be a good fit. There are some faith-based groups that do not um, that do not 
they, they're not as good at listening or receiving feedback and are going to do things their own way. And that's helpful to know. Um, but you just need to know that. So when we do work with faith-based groups, um, these are, are some essential features of collaboration. Um, we want to find where our goals and methods align. Sometimes it's just going to be the goal. <laughs> Sometimes it's just going to be the method, right? Um, that, you know, that can happen. But you've got to have a lot of honest dialogue, clear lines of communication, clear lanes of service, and to practice accountability and feedback. And I am a hopeful person. I come from the faith-based community myself, and um, I, I've seen it when it works. I've seen when it doesn't work. And um, sometimes we just have to say this is just not a good uh, collaboration. This is not, this is not a good fit, um, but sometimes it, you know, it works really well. So um, those are some thoughts. If anyone wants to have further communication around this, I'm happy to, to continue that conversation after the webinar. All right. So real quick, just addressing by curious, I know this doesn't apply to any of you guys. I just wanted to throw the slide in. Just kidding. Um, it's real. Um, it's an individual, we experience this as an individual and we experience this as an organization. Um, I did not spell organization correctly or again. Okay, sorry. But it is something that is that that um, impacts us and it impacts our work and it impacts the way we serve survivors. So we want to talk about it. Um, does your program have a way to assess individual and organizational trauma? Does your program have access to support? Yes, it does. It's called NC Casa. Does your program have policies and practices about this? Um, and it's something that, you know, if you need support, if you need some um, conversation around this, please reach out to NC Casa. We want to support you all so you can do the fantastic and amazing work of supporting survivors in your community. But please um, don't, you know, you're not making things up if you're like, this place is making me feel really crazy. You know, this, this, I, I am really having a hard time because the way people don't deal with things or do deal with things and the passive aggressiveness or the whatever it is in your organization, you know, you know, you, we all need support and um, that can be a very real thing. So uh, we definitely just want to acknowledge that. And um, as we wrap up, I want to acknowledge, um, even in the time we're in right now, I mean, there's a lot of added stress. So I, I really hope that you're taking care of yourself. You're um, doing those things that create, that build resilience, that are restorative, not just relaxing, but restorative. I hope that you're being intentional about that as much as you can. Um, and you're not guilt tripping yourself over that. If you're taking time to just go do something um, that has nothing to do with work, right? Um, I encourage you, you're, you are investing in yourself and you're investing in your community when you do that. Um, looking ahead, um, um, Human Trafficking Commission hopefully will have standards of care rolling out. Um, I am the new rep, uh, regional response team coordinator, so you can look forward to communication around that. Hopefully, we'll update the map and the toolkit. Um, looking forward to more accurate data on human trafficking and continuing to um, have innovative strategies and problem solving. I hope you did um, do your action plan. Um, if you need assistance or some Working with that, um, I'd be very happy to have conversation with you. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to our um, webinar. I've had a lot of fun. Um, and any closing comments or questions or anything can send them to me. And yeah, please reach out to us. We'd love to um, encourage you. And I will be sending out an email of those resources that I mentioned in this presentation. So. Everyone take care, be safe, and wash your hands.